Squirrel listeners, it's time for chapter 11 in, what is this, Anne of Ingleside? Chapter 11, by the end of August, Anne was herself again, looking forward to a happy autumn, small Bertha Marilla, what a name, Bertha grew in beauty day by day and was a center of worship to adoring brothers and sisters. I thought a baby would be something that yelled all the time, said Jim, rapturously letting the tiny fingers cling around his. Bertie Shakespeare Drew told me so. I'm not doubting that the Drew babies yell all the time, Jim dear, said Susan. Yell at the thought of having to be Drews, I presume. But Bertha Marilla is an Ingleside baby, Jim, dear. I wish I had been born, born at Ingleside, Susan, said Jim wistfully. He always felt sorry he hadn't been. Die cast it up to him at times. Don't you find life rather dull? An old Queen's classmate from Charlottetown had asked Anne rather patronizingly one day. Dull? Anne almost laughed in her caller's face. Ingleside dull? With a delicious baby bringing new wonders every day with visits from Diana and little Elizabeth and Rebecca do to be planned for? And with Miss Sam Ellison of the Upper Glen on Gilbert's hands with a disease only three people in the world had ever known to have before? With, with Walter starting to school, with Nan drinking a whole bottle of perfume, oh no, from her mother's dressing table. They thought it would kill her, but she was never a whit the worst, with a strange cat, black cat having the unheard of number of ten kittens in the back porch. With Shirley locking himself, Shirley's a boy, I guess, or either they messed up himself in the bathroom and forgetting how to unlock it with the shrimp getting rolled up in a sheet of fly paper oh no with aunt mary maria setting the curtains of her room on fire in the dead of night while prowling with the candle and rousing the household household with appalling screams life dull <laughs> for aunt mary maria maria was still in ingleside Occasionally, she would say pathetically, Whenever you're tired of me, just let me know. I'm used to looking after myself. There was only one thing to say to that, and of course, Gilbert always said it, though he did not say it quite as heartily as he had at first. Even Gilbert's clannishness was beginning to wear a little thin. He was realizing rather helplessly, uh... Manlike, as Miss Cornelia sniffed, that Aunt, Aunt Mary Maria was by way of becoming a bit of a problem in the household. He had ventured one day to give a slight hint as to how houses suffered if left too long without inhabitants. And Aunt Mary Maria agreed with him, calmly remarking that she was thinking of selling her Charlottetown house. Not a bad idea, encouraged Gilbert, and I know of a very nice little cottage in town for sale. A friend of mine is going to California. It's very like, let's see, it's very like that one you admired so much where Mrs. Sarah Newman lives. But lives alone, sighed Aunt Mary Maria. She likes it, said Anne, hopefully. There's nothing wrong with anyone who likes living it. Alone, Anne, said Aunt Mary Maria. Susan repressed a groan with difficulty. Diana came for a week in September, then little Elizabeth came. Little Elizabeth, no longer tall, slender, beautiful Elizabeth now, but still with the golden hair and wistful smile, her father was returning to his office in Paris, and Elizabeth was going with him to keep his house. She and Anne took long walks around the storied shores of the old harbor, coming home beneath silent, watchful autumn stars. They relived, relived the old windy poplar's life and retraced their steps in the map of fairyland which Elizabeth still had and meant to keep, up, and meant to keep forever. 
hanging on the wall of my room wherever I go, she said. One day a wind blew through the Ingleside garden, the first wind of autumn. That night the rose of sunset was a trifle austere. At All at once the summer had grown old, the turn of the season had come. It's early for fall, said Aunt Mary Maria, in, in a tone that implied the fowl had insulted her. But the fowl was beautiful, too. There was the joy of winds blowing in from a darkly blue gulf and the splendor of harvest moons. There were lyric asters in the hollow and children laughing in an apple-laden orchard, plus serene evenings on the high hill pastures of the upper glen and silvery mackerel skies with dark birds flying across them and as the day shortened little gray mist stealing over the dunes and up the harbor with the falling leaves rebecca dew came to ingleside to make a visit promised for years she came in for a week but was pre prevailed upon to stay too none being so urgent as Susan. Susan and Rebecca do seem to dis discover at first sight that they were kindred spirits, perhaps because they both loved Anne, perhaps because they both hated Aunt Mary Maria. There came an evening in the kitchen when, as the rain dripped down on the dead leaves outside and the wind cried around the eaves and corners of Ingleside, Susan poured out all her woes to sympathetic Rebecca. The doctor and his wife had gone out to make a call. The small fry were all cozy in their beds, and Aunt Mary Maria fortunately out of out of the way with a headache. I just just like a band of iron round my brain, she had moaned. Anyone, remarked Rebecca Dew, opening the oven door and depositing her feet comfortably in the oven, who eats as much, who eats as much uh, fried mackerel as the women did for supper deserves to have a headache <clears throat> as that woman. I do not deny I ate my share, for I, for I will say, Miss Baker, I never knew anyone who could fry mackerel like you, but I did but I did not eat four pieces. Miss Do, dear, said Susan earnestly, laying down her knitting and gazing imploringly into Rebecca's little black eyes. You have seen something of what Mary Maria Blythe is like in the time you've been here, but you do not know the half. No, nor yet the quarter. Miss Do, dear, I feel that, that I can trust you. May I open my heart to you in strict confidence? You may, Miss Baker. That woman came here in June, and it's my opinion she means to stay here the rest of her life. Everyone in this house detests her. Even the doctor has no use for her now. Hide it as he will and does. But he is clannish and says his father's domain must be made to keep unwelcome to his house. I have begged, said Susan, in a tone which seemed to apply that to imply she had done it on her knees. I have begged Mrs. Doctor to put her foot down and say Mary Maria Blythe must go, but Mrs. Doctor is too soft hearted. And so we are helpless, Miss Do, completely helpless. I wish I had the handling of her, said Rebecca Do, who had smartly considered herself under some of Aunt Mary Maria's remarks. I know as well as anyone, Miss Baker, that we must not violate the sacred proprieties of hospitality, but I assure you, Miss Baker, that I would let her have it straight. I could handle her if I did not know my place, Miss Do. I never forget I'm not mistress here. Sometimes, Miss Do, I say solemnly to myself, Susan Baker, are you or are you not a door not, doormat? But you know my hands are tied. I cannot desert Mrs. Doctor, and I must not add to her troubles by fighting with Mary Marie of life. I shall continue to endeavor to do my duty because, Miss Do, dear, said Susan solemnly, 
I could cheerfully die for either the doctor or his wife. We were such a happy family before she came here, Miss D D Miss Do. But she is making our lives miserable, and what is to be the outcome, I cannot tell. Being no prophetess, Miss Do, or rather, I can tell, we will all be driven into a lunatic asylum. <laughs> It is not any one thing, Miss Dew. It is scores of them, Miss Dew. Hundreds of them, Miss Dew. You can endure one mosquito, Miss Dew, but think of millions of them. Rebecca Dew thought of them with a mournful shake of her head. She's always telling Mrs. Doctor how to run her house and what clothes she should wear. She's always washing me, and she says she never saw such watching me. I thought washing me. Watching me, and she says she never saw such quarrelsome children. Miss Do, dear, you've seen for yourself that our children never quarrel, or hardly ever. They are among the most admirable, ch admirable children I've ever seen, Miss Baker. She snoops and prize. I've caught her at it myself, Miss Baker. She's always getting offended and heartbroken over, over something but never offended enough to up and leave she just sits around looking looking lonely and neglected until poor mrs doctor is almost distracted nothing suits her if a window is open she complains of drafts if they are not all shut she says she does not if let me see oops Sits around and nothing suits her if when she complains of drafts. If they are all shut, she says she does like a little fresh air once in a while. She cannot bear onions. She cannot even bear the smell of them. She says they make her sick, so Mrs. Doctor says we might, must not use any. Now, said Susan grandly, it may be a common taste to like onions, Miss Do, dear, but we all plead guilty to it at Ingleside. I'm very partial to onions myself, admitted Rebecca Do. She cannot bear cats. She says cats give her the creeps. It doesn't make any difference whether she sees them or not. Just to know they're there is one. Just to know there is one about the place is enough for her. So that poor shrimp hardly dares show his face in the house. I have never altogether liked cats myself, Miss Do, but I maintain they have a right to wave their own tails. <laughs> and it is, Susan, never forget that I cannot eat eggs, please. Or, Susan, how often must I tell you I cannot eat cold toast? Or, Susan, some people may be able to drink stewed tea, but I am not in that fortunate class. Stewed tea, Miss Drew, as if I ever offered anyone stewed tea. Nobody could ever suppose it of you, Anne. <clears throat> Amen. Nobody could ever. Miss Baker, sorry. If there is a question that should not be asked, she'll ask it. She's jealous because the doctor tells things to his wife before he tells them to her, and she's always trying to pick news out of him about his patients. Nothing aggravates him so much, Miss Do. A doctor must know how to hold his tongue, as you are well aware, and her tantrums about fire. Susan Baker, she says to me, I hope you never light a fire with coal oil or leave oily, oily rags lying around, Susan. They have been known to cause spontaneous combustion. I bet they wish she would. <laughs> she would spontaneously combust. In less than an hour, how would you like to stand and watch this house burn down, Susan, knowing it was your fault? Well, Miss Do, dear, I just had to laugh on her. I just had to laugh. I had my laugh on her over that. It was that very night she set her curtains on fire, and the yells of her are ringing in my ears yet. And just when the poor doctor had got to sleep after having, after having 
been up for two nights. What infuriates me most, Miss Stu, is that before she goes anywhere, she goes into my pantry and collects the eggs. It takes all my philosophy to refrain from saying, why not count the spoons, too? Of course, the children hate her, Mrs. Doctor is just about worn out keeping them from showing it. She actually slapped Nan one day when the doctor and Mrs. Dew were both away. Slapped her? Oops. Just because Nan called her Mrs. Mafusala after having heard that imp of Ken Ford saying it. I'd have slapped her, and <laughs> said Rebecca do viciously. I told her if she did, ever did the like again, I would slap her. An occasional spanking we do at Ingleside, I told her, but slapping never. So put that in pickle. She was sulky and offended for a week, but at least she has never dared to lay a finger on one of them since. She loves it when their parents' punishment, though. If I was your mother, she says to little Jim one evening. Oh, no, you won't ever be anybody's mother, and poor child driven to it. Miss Dew absolutely driven to it. The doctor sent him to bed without a supper, but who would you suppose, Miss Dew, saw that someone was smuggling up, up to him later on? Ah, uh, now who, chortled Rebecca Do, entering into the spirit of the tale. It would have broken your heart, Miss Do, to hear the prayer he put up afterwards. All off his own bat. Oh, God, please forgive me for being impertinent to Aunt Mary Maria. And, oh, God, please help me to always be very polite to Aunt Mary Maria. It brought the tears. into my eyes the poor lamb i do not hold with the reverence or impertinence from youth to age miss do dear but i must confess that when bertie shakespeare drew threw a spitball at her one day i just missed it just missed her nose by an inch miss do i waylaid him at the gate on his way home and gave him a bag of donuts of course, I did not tell him why. He was tickled over it, for donuts do not grow on trees, Miss Do, and Mrs. Second Skimmings never makes them. Nan and die, and I would not breathe this to boil. Uh, I can't breathe today. I'm so sleepy. Uh, not breathe this to a soul, but you must do. The doctor and his wife never dream of it, or would they ever put a stop to it. Nan and Di have named their old china doll with their split head after Mary Mar Aunt Mary Maria, and whenever she scolds them, they go out and drown her, the doll, I mean, <laughs> in the rainwater. Many's the jolly drowning we have had, I can assure you, but you could not imagine what that woman did the other night, Miss Do. I'd believe anything of her, Miss Baker. <clears throat> she would not eat a bite of supper because her feelings had been hurt over something, but she went into the pantry before she went to bed and ate up a lunch. I had left for the poor doctor. Every crumb, Miss Do, dear. I hope you will not think me an infidel, Miss Do. But I cannot understand why the... Let's see. Why the good Lord does not get tired of some people. You must not allow yourself to lose your sense of humor, Miss Baker, said Rebecca Do firmly. Oh, I'm very well aware that there is a comical side to a toad under a harrow. Miss Do, but the question is, does the toad see it? I'm sorry to have both bo I'm sorry to have bothered you with all this, Miss Do, dear, but it's been a great relief. I cannot say these things to Mrs. Doctor and I've been, and I've been vet feeling lately that if I did not find an outlet, I would burst. How well I know that feeling, Miss Baker. Mm. And now, Miss 
Miss Do, dear, said Susan, getting up frankly. What do you say to a cup of tea before bed? And a cold chicken leg, Miss Do. I've never denied, said Miss said Rebecca Do, taking her well baked feet out of the oven, <laughs> that while we should not forget the higher thing of life, good food and a pr good food is a pleasant thing in moderation. Woo that's all I'm so sorry. Tough time reading that. Sleepy. Well, I guess I might as well have to go take a nap and then wake up and start working on. I put my Advent stuff in this little gift bag. Yes, I've got whip bags, but they're all full. <laughs> Love y'all. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. And I'll see you tomorrow at live at 5. And I'll probably see you on somebody's chat. Love you. Bye-bye.